Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Walker. I am the head of insights here at Carta, and I am thrilled to be joining you this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, to discuss all things fund performance. Um, and I have someone who I think is absolutely perfect to discuss this issue with me, all things from the LP side to individual emerging managers. Her name is Beezer Clarkson. She comes to us from Sapphire Partners. Beezer, how are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, please. We are honored to bring you on. Um, so the occasion of our discussion today is Carta is dipping its toes into the fun performance benchmarking game. Look, we've been releasing a lot of data on companies, portfolio companies, startups for quite a while now and have you know, built out some benchmarking and state of the market capabilities. But the number one question that we were getting from emerging managers was, we love the data you have on startups. What about data on us? What about data on the emerging VC? And we took a look at it and it turns out we have quite a lot of data on the emerging VC. So we're gonna walk through everything that we put out in that fund performance report today. Um, thank you so much to those of you, the dozens and dozens of you who submitted questions beforehand. I wanna flag that we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but if you have questions as we go through this, please throw them into the chat, put them into the Q&A. We're trying to try to get to as many as possible uh, and hopefully we make this very useful for you. So to the data. <clears throat> and while I'm in slideshow mode here, Beezer, I won't be able to see your wonderful facial expressions. So if there's a part of this that we should stop on, interrupt me, please. It's all good. I'm here for the ride. Okay, fantastic. Um, everyone, this is some enthralling text from our lawyers. We'd love to start this way. Uh, I'm sure you all read it. Second thing, before you ask, of course, you can have this deck. You can just email me, peter.walker at carter.com. But the vast majority of the data we're going to be talking about today comes directly from the full report itself. So I already put a link into the chat. You can read this fun performance report for yourself. You can digest it. You can marinate in it. You can throw it against the wall if you hate it. Um, but it is available to you right now. Okay, let's jump into the data. First off, uh, I think it behooves us to spend a little bit of time talking about the kinds of funds that were included in this analysis. So first things first, the vast majority of the funds that were included here were on the smaller side. They were less than 100 million um, with a big, big segment of that actually less than 25. So those emerging first funds were a big portion of the analysis. The second point to make, which is something that we wanted to reiterate at the top, is that this is not all the funds on Carta. This is simply those in vintage years 2017 through 2022 that were US venture funds. And they needed to be venture funds that were direct investors. So not fund of funds. We also excluded a bunch of crypto funds because those kind of mess with the data a little bit. So vintage years 2017 to 2022, we realized that is not a grand historical analysis of everything that's gone on in venture capital since the industry you know, moved from whaling to VC, but it's the data we have and every year we're gonna get more robust at it. So 1800 funds is a pretty solid sample size when you look across the other kinds of fund benchmarking that are publicly available, especially when you consider that it's mostly emerging managers. To some of the metadata around these funds, you know, we, we tracked a little bit or we, we put out a little bit of information on how many LPs these funds have. Beezer, I wondered actually if any of this information struck you as odd. Do you think that this is kind of what you were expecting or more or less individual or excuse me, LPs per fund here? It, it futs. What I was thinking when I saw this was for the smaller funds, it's typically fundraisers that are high net worth, friends of friends, family mm -hmm. offices. So that that number doesn't surprise me. The larger funds with an increasingly large number, I suspect it's a combination of bigger checks from institutionals, but then a number of funds I know will collect, again, 20, 30, 40 um, individuals with smaller checks to pull in CEOs or other GPs. So I think I'm betting that's what drives those numbers into the bigger ranges. Do you have a strong sense or a strong preference on you know, LP composition? Like when should funds start thinking about approaching institutional managers or institutional LPs? It's a, generally speaking, I think it's usually, 
because most first-time funds are small, and I know I know that's not what we read about in the news. We always read about the mega first-time fundraisers that are spinning out, and it feels like that's the norm. That is not the norm. Yeah. The norm is what your data is showing, which is they're usually smaller and raised by individuals. So, so those are very much harder to institutionalize. There are not a lot of LPs that are institutional that can write checks into that or have the team set up to find and talk to all of the emerging managers. So you typically see it. This is a gross generalization maybe fund two, more like fund three. And then there's a whole subset of LPs that sit in the endowments, foundations, that kind of world that really wants to wait until a fund four or five or six, because what they mm. want to see is evidence of a GP picking a unicorn and you just will not know for the first handful of years. And now I'll shut up and pass the baton back to you. No, I mean, that's so, that's fascinating that it would be fund four that we're talking about you know, you're not even really starting to have conversations with institutional LPs until nine years into the VC game. That That's a long time. Well, not that you won't. It's just that there's more LPs institutionally that will want to wait and have those conversations. They tend yeah. to write bigger checks. They mm -hmm. tend to have existing portfolios of performing GPs. And in some cases, to do a new manager in their portfolio means not working with one of their existing. So they have to believe that you will do better so if somebody they don't know will outperform someone they do know. And that's that's just a very high bar. Yeah. So there yeah. are definitely fund of funds, asset managers, smaller endowments, smaller foundations that can write more. If you want to have, if you just do the quick math, 28 LPs in a $100 million fund, you're not going to get, you know, it's hard to do a 20 to $25 million check. And that's what a lot of these larger institutional funds will want to do. You can do it, but it's going to be a significant majority of your fund and then you as a GP have to think through how much concentration you want in your LP base. Totally. Yeah, that's well said. I, I don't think it's like one size fits all here, um, but it is interesting that that would be, uh, you know, it might actually be a trade-off on the LP side. Um, okay, first sort of data segment on capital deployment. I think in some ways that this was a fairly pedantic finding. Of course, you would expect probably that funds that started their life cycles in the you know, tail end of the boom time, and then had to deal with the venture capital downturn may have started deploying capital more slowly than other funds. But if you look at this chart, you know, that 2022 vintage, which is the black line there, just, you know, I say a decent chunk behind in terms of capital deployment after 24 months, than their brethren that had gone in the, you know, 2017 to 2020, 2021 vintages. Moving to IRR. So gift for everyone on the uh, virtual event today. In our public report, we obviously put out this IRR chart, but we did it for the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles because we love you and we appreciate that you're on this call. We added some other data. So this actually goes up to the top decile of performance by vintage year for all the funds that were included in this analysis. So that's the 90th percentile of performance. As you can see, it's very obvious that time is the biggest factor on some of these IRR metrics. The later the fund, the more healthy some of those IRR metrics happen to be. We took this data as of Q1 of 2024. So comparing across these vintages is difficult in this exact chart, although it is kind of the data that is most easily accessible to, to fund managers. Is there anything that stands out around IRR or even on a more meta level, how should fund managers think about IRR in the first, say, three to five years of their fund's life cycle? Well, my first thought around IRR is certain kinds of LPs care about it more than others. To your, the point that you made in the in your report, IRR becomes a tool that LPs can use and GPs can use to look across different investments and different timeframes to have a number that you can actually compare. And if you're thinking about LPs that manage public and private money, they, again, gross generalization caveat, tend to care about IRR potentially more than others that don't because they need to compare their public managers with their private managers. And they probably mm. have hurdles if they're deciding if a dollar should go into a venture capital or a public equities manager. And they'll use IRR to sort of say, well, here's where our goal IRR is. And are you adding to it? Or are you subtracting to it? That out of the way. Um, the first few years you're in typically in the J curve of a fund, which is not going to be great IRR. So yeah. the first few years are just, it's not that it, you should ignore it, but I wouldn't, I don't spend any time thinking about it being, to be honest. Great. Good. So then we won't spend any time thinking about it either. Um, that sounds, <laughs> that sounds fair to the, to the managers on the call. 